Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar called Digging for the Community on Food Insecurity. With us today, we have Terry Rothenberger, who will be presenting some of the research that she undertook to meet a need in terms of nutri uh, nutrition in her community. So Terry Rothenberger has a Bachelor of Arts in Cultural Anthropology and is currently in her fourth year of nursing at the University of Saskatchewan. Her roles and practice are heavily influenced by social justice and equity, and her background in anthropology gives her a unique lens to view and navigate healthcare systems which has molded her nursing practice significantly. Terry believes in the importance of giving back to the community. She has volunteered with many organizations throughout her life, such as AIDS Saskatoon, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, co Charity, did I say that right? Oh, Gaoxiang. <laughs> Gaoxiang Charity Olympics and St. John's Ambulance and the Saskatchewan Nursing Students Association. Her focus throughout nursing school has been on therapy dog visits with her dog, Ernie, to an emergency department in Saskatoon and the SNSAS. On the SNSAS, she has had many roles, including class representative, president, past president, sponsorship and fundraising coordinator, mentorship program coordinator, student support and wellness committee co-founder, and digging for the community develop developer. Last year, Terry created a pilot project called Digging for the Community, where surplus produce from private and community gardens was harvested by nursing students and donated to local charities as a means to address food insecurity and wastage. Terry, would you like to introduce yourself some more? Hi, everyone. I am Terry. Um, thank you for having me, Jessica. I'm excited to be here. Um, I think you pretty much summed up everything <laughs> that needs to be said about me. Um, but yeah, we can get started with the talk. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, it's called Digging for the, Com Digging for the Community. Um, and the purpose was to address um, a, a way to address food insecurity in um, our city. So I'm from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and it's situated on Treaty 6 territory, which is home of many First Nations, including Cree, Dene, Nakoda, Soto, and Ojibwe and the traditional homeland of the Métis. So Saskatoon, it's known as a city of bridges. Um, it just has over 270,000 people and it's located along the South Saskatchewan River. So I attend the University of Saskatchewan and there I'm part of the Saskatchewan Nursing Student Association of the Saskatoon chapter. And so here's a picture of all my lovely peers. Um, we all work tirelessly um, to improve the student experience, um, promote professionalism in nursing, and engaging in our community. Um, so that's kind of where digging for the community or digging for the community originated was through our organization. So moving on to the theme of this week, social determinants of health. Um, we're looking at, uh, at food security and as many nursing students know, social determinants of health, everyone has a different perspective of what is included and what's not. Um, it's my firm belief and Jessica said that she liked the word, uh, I feel like food insecurity is a fierce social determinant of health. It impacts absolutely everything. Um, health status and well-being. Um, so just keeping in mind that it's social determinants of health are very it's a very broad topic and um, absolutely anything can impact someone's health and well-being. So just to keep that in mind. Um, the Government of Canada doesn't include food security on their social determinants of health yet, but other organizations have adopted it and recognized how important it is for uh, wellness and health. So um, proof, which um, researches food security in Canada. They define food insecurity as inadequate or insecure access to food due to um, financial constraints. And I like to view food insecurity, not just looking at having or not having food, but also um, the quality of food um, and where you get it from. So, here is, uh, this is from Proof as well, it's from 2018. 
um, but it's reported from 2014. So it's quite outdated, but it's the most recent data available. Saskatchewan has um, food insecurity at about 10.6%. And in Saskatoon, the city where I'm from, it's 11.8. So you see some heart wrenching, wrenching numbers in there in um, the territories in the north. Um, so it would look like Saskatchewan's not doing that bad. Like we look like we're lower than the national average, but this is something an essential um, part of livelihood is food. So being below average is still not that great. People still are struggling with meeting um, their dietary demands and um, being secure in their food availability and food choices. So food is a basic need of life. And if we look at something which in our nursing school, we refer to often Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's at the base. So if you don't have food or you don't have good quality food, um, that really impacts everything moving up and inhibits you from uh, reaching your optimal health and well-being. So to also just keep in mind that Food, when you're food insecure, it not only impacts, impacts your physical health, but also your mental, emotional, and social health as well. So now we have Digging for the Community. Um, and part of what inspired me to come up with this initiative was I am a part of a bunch of Facebook groups like Waste Not, YXE, um, Needs and Yields, all these different groups that where people try to share what they have um, or sell some of their produce and things like that. So it was a couple of falls ago, there's a lady that had all this excess beets and she had posted like, if anyone wants them, come to my yard. So I spent the evening with this lady in her yard and she filled up bags and bags full of beets and still had a ton more left to give away. And there was no way her family was going to use all of them. So then I thought, huh, this is really, interesting like what if there's something that we can do to help our community with all this excess produce because people are constantly posting about them especially around harvest time so that's where it all started i was inspired and then decided to give it a go uh, with my peers on the snsa um so our three main objectives for this initiative was to give back to the community by providing fresh local nutritious food to those in need um, to reduce waste and enhance local food sustainability. Then the third was to raise awareness about local um, food insecurity issues and the supports that are available in our communities for people uh, through educating the people who are donating the produce. Um, so there's already many organizations in our city that are addressing food insecurity and from a lot more upstream approaches such as education and training um, and offering affordable food to people. Um, so it was our goal to just kind of uh, complement that and help out those organizations because it's a huge challenge um, for these organizations to provide fresh, nutritious and affordable food consistently for the people who access their services. And then um, Saskatoon just has an incredible amount of community gardens. We have over 50 but yet we only have a population of 270,000. Plus on top of that, we have all of the private gardens. So people in Saskatoon love to garden, um, but sometimes there's not a lot of options uh, for the excess produce and it goes to waste. Um, so we could also reduce that waste. Um, so kind of the methods we'll go through, some of them are boring, like checking out what food insecurity looks like in Saskatoon. Um, I was able to find 14 organizations um, that are accepting fresh produce donations. There's actually a lot more since uh, we concluded the project this year. A few more um, people have come forward and a lot of people also had suggestions. Um, and then it was also really important that we weren't a burden on these organizations because they, most of these organizations are over capacity um, and usually the need outweighs the resources. So we did not want to be a burden on them. So it was really important to uh, research uh, the locations, drop off times, any 
special requests that they had and what produ produce they could actually use. Um, so organized all of that. And then uh, we dispersed the information through, uh, we created a Facebook page and then also all those gardening type and waste not pages I was on. And then it kind of spread by word of mouth. Our, the College of Nursing sent it out to everybody. Um, and then I just heard from people who we were going to see and picking produce that they heard from this person, they heard from that person. So those community connections were vital in getting the word out. And then uh, CBC contacted me and they had heard about what we were doing. So I also went in um, for an interview and that was another way that we kind of spread our message and what we were doing. And then from there throughout the fall, so we started in August and we went to almost November. Um, we just arranged times for harvesting and picking it up. And then um, also need to coordinate volunteers. There's about 10 core people from our SNSA uh, that were able to come out and help us dig up and collect all these produce. And then um, we deliver to organizations throughout the city. And then the final thing that uh, I thought was important to uh, we sent a thank you email to the donors as well as information about their recipient organization and the services that they provide in the community. And we got a lot of responses back with people not even knowing that these places existed. And so maybe that could spur people to be involved in their communities in the future because they could always use more volunteers. So. So here's some pictures of um, my peers and colleagues digging for the community. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We got outside in the outdoors. Um, some of us didn't know each other very well. So it built, the, built some really great relationships to carry forward into our council to work together throughout the year as well. And you know, fresh air and all that stuff is really good for you. Um, so we collected from 16 individuals or groups. So this ranged from private houses to Maple Leaf Foods had this huge gardening plot and they had us, all of the members that garden there agreed to donate all their potatoes. So we had tons and tons of potatoes all the way to farm gardens, which were massive. Um, so yeah, the donations really ranged in size, but we would take anything. And sometimes I'd go on the Facebook groups if people had posted they had extra stuff and I'd go pick it up on kind of a round. Um, nine organizations were able to receive our fresh produce. So we had some limitations there um, with the busyness of the nursing student schedule um, that made it challenging to reach organizations that had lim limited drop off times. So, um, but we were able to go to nine of them and they all, the, all, we never had to throw out any of the food that we were able to collect. Um, it really showed that there is a really high demand for fresh produce at these places. Um, I thought there was no way I was going to get rid of crab apples. Like I thought everyone would be crab appled out. And there were still places that were like, absolutely, we'll take them. We can make them into baby food or freeze them. That it was unbelievable. I was really shocked. I, I learned a lot. I had no idea that there was such a need. So the organizations, even from the beginning where I was contacting them to see if they'd be interested, they were so excited about this. Um, even people, the places where we we're going to garden um, the produce, they were so excited too because they knew of other initiatives that had happened in the city in the past, but people weren't able to come and actually harvest. And so people with limited mobility or time, they were really excited that we were willing to come and do the dirty work and get the produce and take it out into the community. That's Rachel. She's carrying a lot of, looks like potatoes and beets and carrots. Um, so we were so well received in the community and by these organizations. Um, there were tears, there were just laughter, there's so much joy that we were doing this initiative and that um, busy nursing students would take the time out of their day to come and help and start this initiative um, and to address waste and to address food insecurity. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity for us to continue to build on this initiative. 
Um, some things that we've looked at is earlier collection dates. So then maybe we could hit berry season a little bit better and things like that because there's tons of uh, community parks that have Saskatoon berries and raspberries. Um, partnering with organizations, um, potentially taking out people who access their services that want to get out and garden in the community. There's already some organizations that do that, especially with apple picking. Um, and then kind of hopefully inspiring nursing students or other people to think outside the box and take a look at what other um, resources are in the community that we can use to help people. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think it's, it was just a wonderful opportunity for us to build some really great partnerships in our community. Um, it builds a lot of awareness especially for our council members about what was going on in our community and um, the places accepting produce and the other services that they offered on top of that. Um, and maybe at some point, something like this could be involved in our curriculum for our some kind of community class. Who knows? But um, yeah, people were very receptive. It was great. Some people were even willing to cross picket lines to get us our garden produce. So it was pretty neat. Um, so here I just have some produce that we collected. So tons of different apples, beets, carrots, cucumbers, herbs, lettuce, peppers. Um, and then here's a list of organizations that received our donations um, in Saskatoon. So anywhere from youth centers to transition houses, um crisis nursery the food bank um that's a picture of us at the saskatoon indian metis friendship center dropping off a whole bunch of apples there and that's me and my car that was always full of vegetables <laughs> so yeah and i think that's about all i have to say any questions yeah, thank you so much for your presentation uh, do any of our attendees have any questions that they wanted to ask or should I go ahead for some of the questions that I have? Okay. Uh, well, one question that I definitely have is how do you think a project like this, it was very successful for you and your community, how do you think other communities could take aspects of your project and integrate it into their own community? Um, I think organization is a big thing. I think um, when we started out, it was more about finding out the needs in the community and the organizations around us. Uh, I think that would, took a lot of time. And then from there, we could kind of um, build from there. So just, yeah, learning about what our community needed, I think was the first stepping stone. Um, it sounded like in your process of going around and talking with communities, you really made sure to, to work with the community kind of as a partner instead of going in and saying, we're going to bring all this produce. Um, you try to be as accommodating as possible and really meet these organizations, you know, where they needed to be by trying to find what times work best for them, by actually digging up all the vegetables. And I was just wondering how you initiated the process, like how did you form those relationships with different community centers and partners? Um, it started with phone calls. I mean, I, I kind of approached it as we have this idea, we're a bunch of nursing students, we have this idea um, about putting it out there that we will go and get people's extra garden produce. We don't know if people will approach us for this, but would you be, do you guys have a need for this? And what do you need and how can we get it to you kind of thing and just kind of answering like I had a whole list of questions for them and then um, everyone was so interested in it and so it was kind of like okay well we have no idea the response to this but if we can accommodate whatever you need we will for sure bring you produce and then after that it was calling them to see if they needed that produce at that time and then dropping it off. I did, I do remember that at the conference you had a big lovely poster and here you showed us your PDF. So 
In terms of the research you did, how did that fit into the, the project in of itself? Did you think of the project first and then um, start to consider it as a research project or did it happen kind of vice versa? It was definitely the project idea first and then because I was like, well, this would be cool, but I mean, it was just an idea and I didn't know if it'd be practical or um, what the needs of the community were. So it wasn't so much um, academic research in the beginning um, that kind of came after. It was more like research within the community. Um, and then I also was like, this is so interesting and then kind of furthered my knowledge on it um, kind of while I was in the process, um, me and another classmate, we wrote um, a paper on food insecurity in university students in our school because it's at almost 40%. Um, it was in a, a paper that was published a couple years ago. So we kind of want to research that a bit more. So yeah, it definitely came from like more community research than academic in the start. Now off of, this is a little bit off of the, the project, but in line with the theme of food insecurity, you mentioned doing research surrounding food insecurity at your university. Um, could you talk at all about what you found during that process? Um, just uh, um, well, kind of, it didn't really add to my knowledge, but um, just the fact that like for something essential like food, when we look at something like food, it's something that can be modified or changed based on availability of money or resources. So something like rent, well, you might be able to find a cheaper place to live or whatever, but like usually your rent is a standard expense that you can't um, modify or something like food is very modifiable. And so they're finding that students, it seems to be a nationwide thing that students there's a huge problem with food insecurity for students and students are dropping classes, skipping meals, um, not eating nutritious food. Um, one thing that I did mention um, and kind of just said there needs to be more research on is how we can have people access food banks easier or be more willing to. Um, how do we eliminate that stigma from that because such a small portion of students actually access those resources um well it was it was really interesting and kind of like heartbreaking because knowing that almost 40 percent of the people on our campus potentially 40 percent of nursing students um have had food insecurity in the past year is pretty astronomical and the stigma and the shame and all those things that go along with it um how do we address it i don't know um <laughs> i think it's there's always the opportunity to help in the immediate need but it obviously needs a lot of political help like it needs to be higher up it's the it's a byproduct of a lot of things to be food insecure so i guess just being aware of that have you seen any examples in your practice or throughout this community project of the effects that food insecurity has on people uh, yes, um, I've had, I don't want to disclose too much, but I've definitely see, have seen what it um, can do to young developing children and it's certain conditions and things that we don't think that we would see in Canada and um, we are seeing them and um, lots of times it's in marginalized groups. Um, so that's pretty heart wrenching to see that it is actually real and it's um, a lot of these thing, things could easily be preventable. Um, a lot of them are some what we think is simple vitamin deficiencies, but the reality is, is that if people are food insecure, the quality of the food that they're consuming is probably, well, is definitely not as good as people who aren't um, dealing with food insecurity. Uh, throughout your project, I don't know if this would have come up, but did you ever stumble upon any particular neighborhoods that you would kind of maybe earmark as more food deserts where you notice population of people accessing food services was higher? Yes. Um, 
So kind of like community organizations where people can have, like where there's drop-in centers and things like that. Um, we like to label it on the west side. So that's what it's called in Saskatoon. So there's definitely um, people living who are deeply impacted by all the other social determinants of health there. Um, really the only side, only people that, the only organizations um, kind of in the more affluent areas would be um, places like transitional housing or like the crisis nursery and things like that. Um, but um, all the other organizations that we went to were definitely in areas of town um, for people that are at like have so lower socioeconomic status and um, definitely need those extra supports. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but what is the importance, um, like what caused you to be so interested in food insecurity? Was it something that maybe you learned in your past degree or was it something you learned or witnessed through a nursing? Um, I think it was like a whole bunch of combination of things. Um, my volunteer working has exposed me to a lot of people who have um, lived through food insecurity. Um, I grew up when I was younger in a food insecure household. Um, I was much younger at the time, so I don't remember a whole bunch, but my siblings do, and we talk about it. Um, and then I also just don't like waste, like especially something like food, <laughs> like fresh food, you know, that goes to waste. There's so many people that would, you know, benefit from that and would be so grateful to have it. So when we have people who are planting gardens, how often do people eat everything out of it kind of thing. So that was kind of one of the reasons why I was part of those Facebook groups because people are always like, hey, I'm not gonna eat all this. Does someone else want it? And so not that other people don't need it, but I thought this could be a way for helping um, populations that don't have access to use that excess produce. I think that the route you chose of making produce accessible to these uh, community centers is really interesting because from some of the um, providers I've been to who try to address needs for food insecurity, especially in the past, they didn't have too much produce or fresh food available. I know that in BC, it's, it's getting better and now they try to provide options like um, different meats and milks and produces. Um, but they it's not nearly as vast as the amount of say prepackaged food or um really canned foods any kind of those kind of preserved foods and so i just wanted to commend the fact that you you address the fact of not just food missing but good quality food missing and i think that at least in my school i know one of the issues we do have a food bank and one of the issues for us in pro uh, providing produce, as I'd mentioned in the past, is some issue with food safe, where we, the only food we're allowed to provide, it has to be prepackaged, um, everything has to be done beforehand so that there's no risk, I guess, for contamination, which means that if a student is food insecure and accesses our food bank, unfortunately, the best they will get in terms of produce is canned vegetables. So. With lots yeah. of sodium. Yeah, <laughs> sodium, lots of sugar. Well, and, and then I was also telling you about Shep in our community that has the good food boxes, which they've partnered with the university to make these fresh food boxes that are extremely affordable to students. And you can kind of pick the package of how much fresh produce you want, um, whether it's how much you want or how much you can spend. And then they have pickup spots throughout the city, which includes the university. So it's very, they've really worked hard to make that accessible to students here. Um, another thing too, I, I would hope that it could potentially have an impact if this um, initiative takes, uh, grows, um, is the fact that if we are able to provide fresh produce, because it's all, to me, I, I think sustainability is very, very important for projects. So 
it's not a reality for us in Saskatchewan to provide press, fresh produce throughout the year. But if um, these organizations don't have to budget to spend money on fresh produce in the summer, maybe that, that will give them room or more options to allocate money for that um, in the fall and winter and spring um, to provide more for their people there because they don't have to spend it in the summer. I don't know. That's a good point about sustainability. Was there um, any other questions that anybody wanted to ask or was there anything you wanted to add in terms of food insecurity or the project? I think I, that's it for me. <laughs> Great. Well, um, if there's no further questions, thank you so much for your time. And I will have this recording done as soon as possible. <laughs>